Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Julian Huppert, and I'm the director of the Intellectual Forum here at Jesus College. So we have been responsible for putting this night on together for all of you in the room and for all of those of you who are watching online as well. Jesus is a very old place. Uh, we were founded about 900 years ago as a nunnery, so we're actually even older than the Simpsons are. <laughs> but we've updated, becoming a college in 1496, and opening these facilities just last year. The Intellectual Forum is aimed at getting people to think and talk about anything that's interesting and worthwhile. So we've had world leaders, we've had award-winning academics, uh, we've had major business leaders, we've had Jimmy Choo. But tonight, we're going to have somebody who I think I have actually spent more time listening to than any of the other people that we have. And that's probably true for many of those of you here. Um, I actually just learned earlier today, though, that Harry Shearer and I have another connection. We were actually born about 100 yards away from each other. Um, not quite at the same time. There's one or two years in it. Um, so it's perhaps fate that we're now here. Now, you, you know who Harry is, uh, his amazing skills as, as an author, a writer, a director, a, uh, an actor, a satirist, um, everything from The Simpsons, you know, Montgomery Burns, uh, Principal Skinner, Flanders, to Spinal Tap. As Derek, he really does know how to turn it up to 11. I see a nod from the senior tutor <laughs> appreciating the musical taste uh, shown in that. So it really is an immense pleasure to have Harry here um, to talk about satire and politics. Now, this has been something that's been thought about for a long time. Tom Lehrer, one of my personal heroes, said that satire died when Kissinger won the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> I think Harry has shown that satire can continue, uh, and his show, Le Show, uh, shows just how well that can be done. Now, those of you who know me and know me well will be delighted to hear the other bit of news, which is that it won't be me asking the questions. <laughs> there are going to be three groups asking the questions. You here in the hall, and we have some roving microphones for you when we get to that, and people online. You can use the hashtag SimpsonsQA if you would like to contribute, comment, or ask any questions. But more relevantly, I'm delighted that we're joined by another academic, Tyler Shaws from the Faculty of Education, who actually has a track record. He's worked at Google uh, and, and all sorts of other places, but he has also taught a course on Simpsons and philosophy. So if you want an academic expert to lead this conversation, it's great to have Tyler. Harry, Tyler, it is a huge honour and a pleasure to have you both here. Come on over. This is an exceedingly comfortable chair. Good. We're going to be here for a little while. Yeah. Shall I let you lead things? Please. Off? Thank yeah. you. Um, thank you. Thank you all for coming. I say you all because I live in New Orleans, and that's New Orleans speak. Um, in talking with you about satire and The Simpsons, I'm going to start at the beginning, which is to say my beginning. Um, I grew up in comedy, working as a child actor for the great American comedian Jack Benny uh, for eight years in radio and television. Uh, for those of you sadly not familiar with him, and I. I'm sad to say that's probably a lot of you. Benny was basically a straight man. I don't mean he was a heterosexual male. I mean he didn't tell the jokes. He reacted to the cast of comical characters around him. And even in radio, where you obviously couldn't see his face, his reactions got laughs. Most often, laughs even bigger than the jokes got. His comic persona was an almost complete fictional reversal of his actual personality. Benny the character was cheap, miserly, vain to the point of pain, egotistical to the point of inflicting his insufferable violin playing on friends and audiences alike. In reality, he was warm, generous, giving so many of the laughs to his colleagues, even the eight-year-old me, and a damn good violinist. But he understood how to play really unpleasant human foibles for laughs. I think subliminally I learned from him that as a satirist, one gets better material by portraying even the most monstrous political figures as seriously flawed humans, as opposed to stick figure villains. By the way, for those looking for mystical connections in the tangled strands of life, one of the other actors on The Benny Show and an avuncular friend to me was a gentleman called Mel Blanc, who was the voice of almost all the characters in the cartoon universe known as Looney Tunes. Perhaps amazingly, he never once said to me during the years I knew him, 
kid, here's how you make a packet doing cartoon voices. <laughs> Simultaneously, I was listening to the musical satire of Stan Freeberg, who had chart-topping hit records by parodying chart-topping hit records, and of the aforementioned Tom Lehrer, who wrote original tunes satirizing everything sacred from the Boy Scouts to the Catholic Church. Those are different organizations. <laughs> Uh, I was devoted to an American comedy team, Bob and Ray, who did gentlest of satire at the expense of the banality of American media, and to the goons who hid some satire, as you know, beneath layers of arcane silliness. And like my peers, I devoured issues of Mad, sort of the polite version of Viz, a magazine in America devoted to marginally post-adolescent skewering of most American pieties. And then in university, while I was reading Swift and Voltaire, I was exposed to a completely different kind of satire. It came in the form of an ugly little newsprint publication called The Realist. And it got me into at least a few arguments over a piece it published called The Parts Left Out of Death of a President. Purportedly, it was printing a chapter omitted from the book of that name, which was a dutifully turgid chronicle of the Kennedy assassination. The chapter in question, written in pinpoint accurate emulation of dutiful turgidity, concerned President Johnson's flight back from Texas to Washington in the plane that contained the body of his slain predecessor and a scene in which the new president lustfully defiled the remains. The accuracy of the lampoon of bad historical writing convinced me beyond all reason that the excerpt was real. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm not a betting man. Shortly out of university, I joined an experimental new radio program. The news department of a rock and roll station had reimagined itself as a satirical project. Station management, faced with perennial bad ratings, couldn't think of a good reason why not. And I joined the show about three months into its life. It was called The Credibility Gap, and its first iteration was broad and kind of cartoony and very popular. We moved to another station a couple years later. Given more time and freedom, the group deepened its satirical approach, mixing absurdist whimsy with a more nuanced portrayal of the malefactors at the top. And again, we were popular right up to the time we were fired. <laughs> and then, of course, there was a little film called This is Spinal Tap, but enough about that. <laughs> These are some of the strands that make up my particular view of satire and its uses. And then I walked into The Simpsons. Thanks to the fact that Matt Groening, whom I encountered at a street corner newsstand in Hollywood, when there were still such things as newsstands, told me he was a fan of my radio show. I told him I was a fan of his newspaper column. He was supposed to review records, and he never did. There's a more complex twist to this story, but for our purposes, I ended up on the show as it began its now record-breaking run on the Fox network, a network which was at the time nothing more than a peculiar Murdochian fever dream. As you may know, television in the US is a writer's medium. That is to say, neither actors nor directors have much to say in what story and dialogue appear on the screen. The basic template for The Simpsons was established by the three gentlemen whose names you see at the top of every episode. Matt Groening was an absurdist and satirist whose comic strip appeared in alternative newspapers. Sam Simon was a veteran sitcom writer, the late Sam Simon. And Jim Brooks was known for writing and directing smart dramas and at least one witty comedy, Broadcast News. The recipe for the show was a mixture of their various artistic tastes. But the show's early writing staff tipped substantially in the direction of the strongly satirical. George Meyer had come from an absurdist journal of topical humor called for no apparent reason, Army Man. I don't know where John Schwartzwelder came from, or where he went, or where he was while he was here. <laughs> but the dozens of scripts he submitted during the show's first decade or so were jewels of sparkling dialogue and subversive wit. Season three, I've mentioned before, saw the show's most overly satirical overtly satirical episode when Mr. Burns runs for governor of a state which has no name, and three-eyed fish begin to appear in waters near his nuclear plant for no apparent reason. The show has shifted to a more family-centric direction as it's moved into the decades. Homer now seems to be largely untethered from his job and undertakes adventures far removed from Matt's early prescription that the writers treat the characters more like real people than cartoon characters. But through it all, James Brooks' most profoundly influential decision about the show remains in force. As a successful movie maker dealing with a then-fledgling television network, he was able to cut a deal unique in American television. Fox would have no creative input into the show. 
unlike all other American TV where creative executives deliver notes, Fox's input would consist of meekly suggesting that two mentions of the word ass in one episode might be enough. <laughs> Given the fact that one often hears America reveres nothing more than success, you might think other networks seeing The Simpsons become a runaway hit would have emulated the practice of desisting from creative interference. But no, several years into the show's run, I saw an ABC executive proudly announcing that their solution to the previous season's ratings woes at that network was to add a lot of new personnel to the, what they chose not to call the creative interference department. <laughs> In any case, The Simpsons continues to make the case for light touch supervision, an example not taken up by the cable networks and streaming services. By the way, for a wonderfully cur curated collection of those network notes, try sometime to find a little book, long out of print, by Leonard Stern, who wrote a hit show from the 1950s called My Favorite Martian. The title of the book he basically collected was inspired by a note that was scribbled in the margin of a script page by a CBS executive. He circled a line of dialogue from an episode of My Favorite Martian and wrote in the margin these immortal words. A Martian wouldn't say that. <laughs> Tells you all you need to know. <laughs> so as the topic sentence of this talk asks, wither satire when politics allegedly goes beyond it, when presumably reality has gotten so grotesquely cartoonish that it can no longer be cartoonishly exaggerated. The media, as you know, are full of quotes from practitioners admitting that reality has gone too far. Uh, I still remember the story of Tom Lehrer, alluded to by uh, our host, who uh, said, actually, the political satire was obsolete after the, Henry, the awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize to Henry Kissinger. Of course, we've seen some stranger Nobel Peace Prizes since as well. <laughs> but clearly he was, at, uh, Mr. Lehrer was at best premature. So what now? As I've indicated in my own sojourn through the satirical wonderland, there are many varieties, maybe slashing cartoonishly, a la spitting image, to take one example, is not what this moment calls for. Maybe the turn is focusing on reality, back to the source of the funniest material ever. A few years ago, a bit ahead of this curve, I went back to a mother load of reality-based satire, the White House tape secretly recorded by then President Richard Nixon. There, without benefit of writers, was the leader of the free world inviting to intimates that when he goes to San Francisco, he can't shake hands with anyone because the place has been so thoroughly taken over by homosexuals. There's Nixon caught up in an early scandal involving the dairy industry lecturing a group of gobsmacked milk lobbyists on why the beverage should be marketed as a sleep aid. There is the president ordering the aforementioned Kissinger late of Harvard that under no circumstances were Harvard professors to be welcomed to the White House while Kissinger obsequiously agrees. This is the same Kissinger, by the way, still with us, recently, <laughs> recently cited by Hillary Clinton as one of her foreign policy advisors and even more recently seen consulting with President, sorry, President, President Trump. <laughs> if satire had any actual power to influence the world, it wouldn't be children in cages right now, it would be Kissinger. From my point of view, we're sort of living in the art form's golden age. You don't have to imagine a president lecherously commenting about his own daughter. We've got him. You don't have to conjure up a leader whose lies are so numerous and obvious that the laziest journalist can debunk them with one click to Google. We've got him. You don't have to conceive of a slapdash pseudo-populist. He is here in the flesh asking for nothing more than our constant attention. You don't even have to concoct a first lady who on a trip to visit children separated from their parents by a policy of her husband wears perhaps for the first time in her adulthood a $39 Zara garment just so she could broadcast the message scrawled on it, quote, I don't really care, do you? We've got her. This may be why both journalists and satirists are bemoaning this moment. Normally politicians, even ones as venal and resentful as Richard Nixon or as unmindful of changing social mores as William Jefferson Clinton or as pathetically hungry for a special relationship as Tony Blair, Normally they see the need and have the ability to perform behind a scrim of dignity and propriety 
which it is the duty as well as the pleasure of journalists and satirists to deftly destroy with scoops or flights of satirical imagination. In the present moment, I don't need to tell you, there ain't no scrim. I might even suggest that this lack of artifice, which may itself be an artifice, is part of what inflames the opposition, or as it likes to style itself, the resistance. George W. Bush and his cronies told, by one count, 935 lies on our way into the Iraq War. But he didn't put his oafishness, his mendacious bellicosity, and the reality of his torture regime on daily Twitter display. And his jingoistic attacks were aimed at the always hapless UN rather than at China and Europe. Barack Obama struck the pose of dignified political realist as he refused to investigate and prosecute U.S. torturers, and he only demurely allowed the best publications to print leaked portraits of him sitting alone with his spy master, deciding which alleged terrorists to drone kill without benefit of any legal process, except perhaps for getting a drone permit. Maybe what we're realizing a bit late is that it's okay to ignore the big norms as long as you honor the small ones. So as I say, satirists might well go back to the formula my colleagues and I used in a certain mockumentary. Observe the real absurdity, edit out the boring parts, comically highlight what's left. It obvious, obviates the need for such strenuous exertions as, gee, what if Trump, Trump did ecstasy? And instead gives us jewels like Bill Clinton is on a book tour in the era of Me Too and still can't apologize to Monica Lewinsky. <coughs> Or for that matter, Tony Blair follows up his role as PR man for the Kazakhstan dictator by announcing himself a world ph philanthropist. Unlike the Washington commentators, and I'm almost done, unlike the Washington opinionators who think Trump has changed American politics forever, I have a slightly darker view. Trump benefits from the peculiar Teflon effect that America confers on our TV celebrities. For them, the rules do not apply. O.J. Simpson can get away with murder, and the Kardashians can get away with having no discernible talent. <laughs> as soon as the current president departs the scene, which may be soon, thanks to his ex-fixer, that's right, you don't even have to imagine a president with a fixer, US politics will snap right back to what will then seem refreshingly, boringly, deceptively normal. So enjoy this particular horribleness while you can. Thank you. Some questions. Um, you covered a lot, a lot of ground in this. Put some things on the table. Yes. Um, let me start with a big question. Yeah. In terms of like, is satire still important now, today? Depends what you mean by important. Um, uh, satirists, I think, are, are deluding uh, themselves, ourselves, if we ever think we have a serious effect on uh, politics. Um, I think, ridic you know, first let's, let me make the, the distinction that I made with you when we first started this conversation on Twitter. Yes, we met on Twitter. Uh, not, not Tinder, Twitter. Um, I, I make a distinction between satire and topical comedy. Topical comedy is what we have in great uh, profusion on American television right now. Uh, if you ever see the late night shows of Kimmel and Fallon and uh, Colbert um, and Trevor Noah, and Samantha B. Samantha Fecklessly uh, B. Um, you know the, the reference I'm making? Samantha B. referred to. Yeah. Anyway, um, they engage in topical humor. Um, and it's a great tradition of late night television. You, f you find one particular characteristic that sort of sums up a president. Ronald Reagan was so dumb. Uh, George H.W. Bush was, uh, had problems with the English language. Uh, Bill Clinton was horny as hell and hungry as hell. Uh, uh, George W. Bush was dumb as hell. Uh, they didn't have one for Barack Obama because they liked him so much. And now this guy. Um, and then you just write eight or ten jokes a night on variations on that particular theme. I think satire really deserve that name, needs to dig a little deeper uh, and ask what these guys are doing and maybe even why. Um, and 
you know, it's important in the sense that, and this may be good or bad, depending on your point of view, it serves as a relief valve for a lot of the anger that at least some of the creators have, uh, and maybe some of the audience do, does as well. Now, political activists would say, we don't want a release valve for that anger. We want to channel it in activism and voting and all that. So satire may be a negative force. I don't know. But I think that's the only uh, social role it really has. OK. Um, speaking in terms of, like you mentioned, the different presidents and these different generations and everything, um, from your experience, which spans a lot of decades, uh, successful satire. Yes, I made fun of the dinosaurs, you know. <laughs> um, how has humor and satire changed? Like, have you noticed specific things in terms of? Oh, I think the cultures, the the, the, the general Western, or at least American and British culture, but more particularly American culture, has gotten coarser, uh, looser, is would be another way of putting it. Uh, more is permitted to say. Although, I have I have this contrary theory about that. Um, which uh, grows out of personal experience. Um, because um, I was with this comedy group in the 1970s. And um, we would make fun of racists, because it's America. We got racists. And um, we were on radio, and we would depict racists talking the way racists talk. Uh, and. At that same t period of time, I got fired from a radio station that I was working at doing a comedy show. For uh, I did a sketch. No reason why I should go into why this word appeared in the sketch, but it did. For good and, and legitimate reasons, the word penis appeared in the sketch. I was fired for saying the word penis. Flash forward 20 years, the words that were spoken out of racist mouths in its satirical sketches were no longer allowed to be spoken on American broadcasting. But Howard Stern was getting half a billion dollars a year for saying penis and vagina and all the rest of it. So th this led me to the, a, a half cock theory that there is such a thing, maybe a third or fourth Newtonian law, the law of conservation of taboo, that there's always a, 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 a same amount of the same amount of taboo, but it just moves and attaches to different objects over time. So maybe that's all that's happened. You know, it, it's looser on some things and not as loose on others. But certainly, in terms of the uh, the sexual vocabulary that's available to com comedy in general and satire, uh, I mean, Samantha Bee would have gotten kicked off the air for saying what she said about uh, Ivanka Trump 20 years earlier. Even in the Simpsons movie, we, we saw Bart's penis temporarily, whether we wanted to or not. So there was that. It wasn't really Bart's penis. It was a, it was a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> Hate to break it to you, but. So I have to ask, as an American currently living in England, what do you see as the differences between American and British political satire? Are there different styles? Are there different tones or flavors? Well, I think the uh, British satire has always either chosen or been able to assume uh, a greater degree of information in the heads of its audience than American. Uh, you know, um, I think the reason the topical comedy has become the, the, the dominant flavor as opposed to satire in America is because a topical comedy doesn't assume anything more than that you saw the headline at 6 o'clock. And right. now here it is at 11.30 and we got a joke. Um, and certainly Trump has been a gift to topical comedy in the sense that he's engaged in this demonic dance with the media, which he's done for 30 years starting in, in when he was in New York with the New York tabloids. I don't know if you know this, but he was in the habit of calling up the New York tabloid newspapers, <coughs> pretending to be his own PR man. It was either John Miller or John Barron. Interestingly enough, his younger son, he chose to name Barron, in tribute to himself, I guess. Um, <laughs> and he, he would call up as his own PR man to say, to, to drop little tidbits like, Marla Maples, his new girlfriend, says 
uh, their night together last night was the best sex she's ever had. And the New York tabloids would dutifully print this stuff, and then he would denounce them, and the game would go on. And so this game continues now, except on the national stage. Mm. Uh, all he wants is attention. All the media want is attention. And they're in this, you know, Tim Wu wrote a, a wonderful book recently about the advertising business called The Attention I've read it. Excellent. Yeah. And this is what it's all about. And so you can now assume that people know the, the story of the day because this dance has gone on ad infinitum. Um, I, don't, I got way off the question. No, it's okay. Um, speaking of books, so the Tim Wu book is called The Attention Merchants. Yes. And it's a good segue to the next question, which is, let's talk about The Simpsons a little bit in mm. terms of, uh, you've probably seen a lot of headlines that have come out over the past several years now about, is The Simpsons still relevant? Do people still pay attention to The Simpsons? I'm curious about your perspective on it. Well, you know, uh, there's a word that's uh, become a, a horrible cliche in America now. Uh, People talk about their journey. Yes, yeah, this is my journey through addiction and out the other, you know, whatever your journey is. Um, I don't mean to belittle addiction, I'm just mean the use of that word journey is to describe what people go through. The Simpsons have been, has had a, quite a journey in that regard. Um, when it started on the air, um, Christian conservatives were denouncing the show, uh, saying that Bart was a terrible role model for children. <laughs> Apparently oblivious to the fact that characters in comedies are always bad role models. <laughs> That's sort of the idea. Uh, and within a decade, I was doing interviews with Christian magazines who put uh, Ned Flanders on the cover in one case. <laughs> because they realized that The Simpsons was the only television show on American, in American broadcasting that had not one but two, Lovejoy and, and Flanders, uh, avowed uh, church-going or church-working uh, Christian characters. No other, no other show had that. So it took 15 years for the blind man to discover that much of the elephant, and now you know, they keep discovering different parts of the beast uh, as time goes on. Um, as, I, as I noted in, in the remarks, I, the show has changed, uh, it's evolved, uh, and uh, because of the changes, writers move out, you know, uh, if John Schwarzwelder is watching, please, <laughs> we love you still. Um, but, uh, you know, writers go off to develop their own shows, uh, or get work on other in other places, uh, and the and the show does evolve, and we find uh, the cast members. You know, we as I mentioned, uh, it's a writer's medium, so we don't you know we don't ad lib, and if we do, it doesn't make any difference. But um, the one thing I think all the cast members have have tried to do in this welter of of writers that have been through The Simpsons is to uh, try to defend the characters, try to defend what the audience knows about the characters, what we've brought the audience to know about the characters. So that, for example, there was a, a, a notorious uh, episode in, I think, season 12, where one of the people I play, uh, Seymour Skinner, was revealed not to be Seymour Skinner at all, uh, to be uh, Armin Tamzarian, uh, this, uh, this completely other person that was made up for the purpose of this episode. And, you know, I, I did avail myself of the opportunity to say, you are spitting in the face of people who have watched and lo loved this show for 12 years and know this character as well as other characters by saying, oh, no, no, forget all that. Uh, and they went ahead and did the show, and now it's, you know, we, we don't speak of that. <laughs> so the cast really does view it as our, as our obligation to just protect what we know about the, you know, I will say on occasion uh, when a, a writer thinks that it's amusing to have uh, Flanders say a joke that uses the name of Jesus, the way this college does, um, <laughs> um, that Flanders wouldn't do that, you know. So, um, relevant, you know, uh, 
I don't even know how, uh, I mean, in, in TV executive speak, you measure that by uh, gross ratings points, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in which case, The Simpsons is doing okay in a universe of declining broadcast television audiences. Uh, we still have our head kind of above water, unlike most of the shows on most of the networks. Um, we're at the end of season 30. Uh, the question is, uh, that's the end of our current contract, so we'll see what happens. And, and someone else will decide if it's relevant enough to renew. I think we'll have a lot of questions from the audience, and I'm sure people are eager. I have one more quick question yeah. for you. What would Ned Flanders have to say about this topic that we've been discussing? It's a blessed topic. <laughs> the good Lord has given me the, the light to see that this is a, a topic that deserves good conversation on all sides. <laughs> So we take some questions from the audience who are here. Uh, we have microphones going around, and for people who are following online, we have our Twitter hashtag um, uh, Simpsons QA. So tune in, and then we'll be uh, monitoring some of these things. So, um, gentlemen in the corner here. It's um, it's arguable that um, our Brexit negotiations are. Excuse me, beyond satire. Um, and recently, uh, business was getting concerned, and our foreign secretary, a, a satire of himself, Boris Johnson, used a four letter word to describe business as his response. So I'm very interested in the views of business into how they react to that. And I think that Mr. Burns might have a view, and it would be great to hear it. <laughs> Fuck Boris. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Short and sweet. Anybody yeah. else? There you go. There's a guy. Thanks for the setup. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I have a question. Like, can you share us with a moment uh, in your career that you felt like? Uh, you did something, or you broadcast something, and afterwards you said, oof, we went too far, or something like that. Ah. Um, well, while I'm searching for what I may have thought went too far, I'll, I'll tell you about uh, when I was party to something that someone else felt went too far. Uh, I mentioned this, this radio show that I was with. We did satire about the news every day. And um, uh, the then vice president uh, under Nixon uh, was, uh, and this is the middle of the uh, Vietnam War, was making a highly political visit to a veterans hospital uh, to get you know, uh, photo op points, I guess you would say. And so we did our version of that scene uh, with the sounds of, of just to dramatize the kind of hypocrisy of this, uh, the sound of people groaning in pain in the back, you know, in the background. Uh, because you couldn't show what people looked like in there, it was radio. And uh, the general manager of the radio station never listened to the show, which was a good thing. Um, but he got a letter from somebody listen, who listened who said this was really over the line. And uh, this woke him up from his torpor and he handed down a decree uh, that we had to do a sketch on a following show that made the vice president look good. <laughs> Which, in my opinion, went too far. <laughs> um, but uh, I, this, is, this is me actually thinking. Um, I can't honestly say that I've done something that I thought was over the line. Um, I mean, it, it, it is, I think, probably uh, an artifact of the fact that I've been in broadcasting for most of my life. And uh, to stay on the, and in, in many cases, live broadcasting, and to stay on the air, you have to learn where the guardrails are very, very 
early and really keep them in mind. So that's probably been the reason why I haven't even been tempted to go over the line because I'd get kicked off and I, I like it too much. Uh, so, but we had to make Spiro Agnew look good for 15 minutes. You know. uh, yes, up front. And then you got a balcony. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm? Oh. Uh, too much gesticulating. Hello, Larry. Hi. Uh, expanding on the theme uh, earlier around the influence of satire um, on politics, if you go back to the uh, to was it 2000 when uh, one of the episodes where um, Trump actually got elected? Mm -hmm. um, you think we made so that happen? I want, yeah, I wonder how much influence that might have had. Uh, so I know it's seven, 18, 17 years later, but was it a slow burner? Do you reckon? If only we could. If, if only we could harness that power for evil. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, th I think it, it, you know, you do 30 years of television and, and uh, a couple things are going to come true, you know. Uh, I think it's just law of average has caught up with us. Uh, and he was, he was uh, always talking about it, so uh, it, it seemed like an uh, obvious joke to make. Yeah, what if it ever happened, you know? It's like, uh, what, what if, you know, it's like if, if The Simpsons did a, a, an episode that made reference to what if, you know, a, a time in the future when Roseanne really was a responsible human being. Because she keeps talking about wanting to become one. You know, same thing. Can I interject also and just say that um, in the, two th I think it was the 2000 election, but uh, Donald Trump did it announce intentions to run for something, and I think he like very quickly ran out of steam. He was, yeah, he was, he was announcing as a, as a reform party candidate. Yeah, that's right, yeah. party that Ross Perot had started a decade earlier, and he diddled around with that for a while. So it didn't come from nowhere. It, it had a, a basis in reality, if this be reality. It's all a dream, you know. Uh, question up there, yeah. Hi, Harry. Uh, Hi. Thanks for coming. Thank you, you brought a lot of pleasure to me for almost half my life. Oh, uh, thank you. Relevant or not. Um. <laughs> <laughs> hey, pleasure is always relevant. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, around about the start of my life, uh, Spinal Tap came along. And uh, I, I don't know how much you can talk about the uh, legal battle. You can't. OK. <laughs> um, I guess I just wanted to reflect on, uh, I guess it had some relevance if, uh, if people could make that much money out of uh, a spinal tap. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll put the mic back. <laughs> My attorney thanks you. <laughs> Whoever's on YouTube, just edit that last part out. Um, yes. Hi, Harry. Hi. Um, I was just thinking at a time when journalism is struggling for cash, um, at a time when comedy is making lots of it, is there a way in which perhaps comedy could step into that role? I know that Armando Iannucci, for instance, a king of British satire, has said that uh, you know, people like John Oliver have done a great job in investigating the news in a way that the journalists perhaps haven't been able to. Is that something that comedy could do? Well, um, the, the guy who uh, I cited earlier as the author of the piece about uh, Lyndon Johnson defiling the uh, body of uh, Jack Kennedy uh, actually used to describe himself when he was active as an investigative satirist. So it's, it's, it's not new to cross that line. Uh, I've, I've crossed it myself. Uh, I'm a New Orleanian, as I mentioned, and I did uh, uh, a documentary about why the city flooded because the national media uh, didn't pay attention to the story. Uh, you know, it's painful for me to see Donald Trump attacking the national media uh, because he's doing it for all the wrong reasons. Uh, he's doing it for, you know, he, 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 in the same way that you can answer most questions about why something is the way it is in America by saying money, uh, you can answer most questions about Donald Trump by saying it's about him. He's a narcissist. Um, but the, the problem with American journalism is not that it's too critical of Donald Trump. Uh, the problem is that it's been resource drained for a long time. And, it, and many of these media are now what I call Potemkin media. You know, the front page looks the same, or the anchor at the desk looks the same. But if you look behind, there's no, there's no reporting staff there anymore. My favorite example of it is a few years ago, an anchor, on, uh, we call them anchors, uh, newsreaders. Um, 
on NBC opened up a, a Sunday morning broadcast by saying uh, there's a major breaking news story this morning in Pakistan and for the latest we uh, for uh, reporting on it we go to NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel reporting this morning from London <laughs> as you can see Pakistan from here right uh, the only the only thing that wasn't true in that sentence was the word chief he meant only um, and I, I, I did a, a talk at the National Press Club and, uh, after my documentary came out about my experience with the media, uh, both when I was a kid working for Newsweek and uh, having made this documentary and having assumed that the national media might be interested in the update on a story they had covered so slavishly when it first happened. Um, and it was uh, punctuated by a piece that was written in The New Yorker by an excellent journalist called Peter Moss about the uh, toppling of Saddam Hussein, Hussein's statue in April of 2003 and how reporters and photographers on the scene kept saying to their editors and producers in New York, there are almost no Iraqis here. This is the Marines doing this. Let us turn around and show that there aren't and the editors and producers in New York were saying, no, no, what we're seeing on CNN is the statue being toppled by Iraqis, so show, tell us the sto that story. Um, it's a, there's a word the New York Times actually uses itself, narrative. And my experience is that once the editors or producers fix on a narrative based on the first rush of facts, what they want going forward is just color, descriptive color, or quotes that abet the narrative. And, and reporting that contradicts the narrative is unwelcome. That's a structural problem in American journalism that gets only worse when there aren't even any reporters left to contradict the narrative. But I think it's up to, you know, we, we lived through this period of about uh, 10 years ago you remember it, I'm sure, when uh, the internet was going to provide us with citizen journalists. And um, we've seen where that ended up, you know. It ended up with fake news. Um, so uh, the, the question, and now we are in such a daffy circumstance where if you saw the, the story today, the Koch brothers who spent years denouncing American media and uh, subsidizing climate change denial and all the rest of it are now giving grants to journalism entities. That's how crazy this has gotten. I don't know if the worm is eating its own tail or throwing its own tail up, but that's where we, that's where we are. Um, oh, yeah. Hi. Question up here. Hi. Um, so you mentioned Kissinger a couple of times. And it reminded me of an interview he gave a couple of years ago when, and he says in that interview something to, um, something like, so you commentators and journalists spend your lives trying to understand reality as we make it, right? And once you understand it, we just move along and create a new one. So since you've spoken about narratives, uh, I was wondering, do you believe that satire can have a comparable power or at least has a chance of unveiling this mechanism in it so in what sense yeah uh, that was in the latter days of the George W. Bush administration and it was uh, some I think his conclusion of that sentence or that thought was that uh, you live in the reality based universe we're way ahead of you you know we're we're creating something way beyond that um, yeah, I mean, a satire does have the, the power to unveil. That's, that's one of the things I, I mentioned earlier is like our, our traditional job is to unmask these, these uh, disguises of decorum and dignity that these scandalous, power-hungry <laughs> people uh, affect. And that's what's so, so scandalous about Trump is that he doesn't bother with it. He just doesn't bother with these norms of piety and, and propriety. Uh, 
And so, yeah, of course, that's, that's our main job, is to just rip the facade off and go, look, look, the writhing mass of, the writhing, wriggling mass of worms underneath. Um, so that's our basic job description, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Oh, I thought that was a hand raise. He's just, you're just leaning. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Is there another one? Uh, right, right over here, this, uh, in the front row. What about the internet? What about our internet questions? Still looking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this I damn do, internet. I do have one, but right. you first, please. It's just following up from that question. Mm. So a lot of journalists have come forward, say, after the Trump election to say that, well, we apologize, we didn't do more because we just didn't take this particular candidates seriously. Do you think that satirists feel as if they could have done more or? More what? I mean, I was making fun of him throughout the campaign. Uh, um, you know, it's not our job to, uh, by the way, it's interesting you say that because there was just an election in New York City, a very liberal, progressive, 28-year-old woman was elected, uh, won the Democratic primary for her congressional seat. And there's been exactly the same amount of wailing and lamentation about, we didn't take her seriously enough. We didn't see this coming. We didn't, you know. It's like, um, I think, an occupational hazard of journalism to make assumptions about what's normal and what's not. And um, even though what's not normal fits into the textbook definition of what is news, uh, it gets not covered more frequently than you would expect, uh, especially in politics, because I think political journalism suffers from one major malady, and fortunately satirists uh, are entitled to do this. I don't think journalists are. Uh, uh, part of what satire does, as with the case of The Simpsons in 2000, is to make uh, preposterous presumptions about what might happen in the future. But political journalists spend way too much of their time trying to anticipate what's going to happen in the future, in the next election, in the next cycle. Uh, and that's why the slavish devotion to political public opinion polls, which are supposed to tell us what's going to happen in the future, uh, and and why they uh, like hanging around with po politicians so much, uh, so they can hear inside gossip and then project that into the future. I think we'd be much better off if they'd spent their time actually reporting on what's going on and let us take care of the future. <laughs> um, internet question real quick before we... Uh to return to reality here. This is from Richard Taylor. It's a question slash comment. Thank you for your question, uh, Richard. And Thank you for your comment. <laughs> I wonder if Harry Shearer knows that the BBC iPlayer volume control goes up to 11, almost certainly in homage to his work. Not only, and the uh, volume in the uh, uh, audio system in the Tesla also goes up to 11. <laughs> you can pay much more for, uh, than you do for the iPlayer and still get 11. Very satisfying answer. There you go. Um, question in the back. Hi, Harry. Hi. Um, there have been a lot of uh, amazing special guest appearances on The Simpsons in its time, including our, our very own Stephen Hawking. Yes. Um, I was wondering if there's anyone uh, you admire who hasn't been on the show yet you'd like to see, or in the spirit of this talk, anyone you'd like to see made fun of that hasn't yet been on? Well, of course, um, it'd, it'd be a coup to get uh, the real Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, I don't mean the one who was president, but uh, yeah, uh, that's not going to happen. Um, well, I'll tell you in lieu of, of a direct answer to your question, the most... Uh, memorable guest appearance, because normally we're not around uh, anymore for the guest appearances. They're, you know, they're on their own schedules, and so uh, they, they record at a time of their own choosing. But um, in the old days, uh, Michael Jackson was uh, a guest on the show, and he was portraying, as you I'm sure know, a 300-pound white metal patient who was convinced he was Michael Jackson. <laughs> uh, 
probably no less of a delusion than the real Michael Jackson was under, but um, so we have a read through. This, we were in this in at this point we were in a large uh, sound stage. It was just a little about a, a 25 percent bigger than this room, and a lovely large sound stage. And we're at a table, long table, and Michael Jackson is a few chairs down from me, and Yardley Smith is who plays Lisa is sitting next to me on my left, and uh, we're reading this, the script. And Michael is reading the dialogue that uh, is for his character. And then uh, his character at some point uh, breaks out in song. And it's a version of his song, Ben, with new lyrics. And Michael sits back and nods, a very slight nod across the table. And a, and a white guy across the table starts singing in a very Michael Jackson-like voice. And, you know. Nobody says anything. <laughs> it's like, the, you know, this is normal. Um, and finally, I just couldn't take it anymore. I just leaned while well, he was still singing. And I think I know who it, I've later learned who it was. And it may have been Kip Lennon. Lennon. Kip Lennon, who is the son of the Lennon sisters, uh, who does a lot of singing gigs. but. At the time, I didn't know who it was, but I just leaned over to uh, Yardley Smith, and I, I surmised in whispered tones, I think we paid just enough for the talking Michael Jackson. I don't <laughs> think we paid enough for the singing Michael Jackson. <laughs> but uh, I, wow, um, I think it would be fun an odd way to have Mark Zuckerberg on the show, <laughs> for obvious reasons, and just to reveal all sorts of stuff about his private data. <laughs> we have time for one, maybe two questions if they're quick. So if you've got something, uh, yes, in the back here. Run, 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 run. <laughs> So there seems to be a lot of anger in politics, both uh, here and in America at the moment. Do you think it's possible to be too angry to make good satire? You get the fuck out of here! <laughs> I don't have to listen to that shit. Um, speaking personally, anger is where my humor comes from. It's where I, I was talking about channeling it or a safety valve for it. You know, that's I get pissed off about somebody or something and I, I want to make fun of it. I do think there's a, a, I don't know about Britain, but I have a theory about what's going on in the States, which I've not seen elsewhere. Um, I think that we're going through a long-term slow motion crisis of legitimacy in the American democracy. Uh, Bill Clinton was regarded as a, a borderline legitimate president by his opponents because he, he always, there was a third party in both of his elections, so he never won a majority of the vote. Uh, George W. Bush, of course, was elected by the Supreme Court, so the opposition didn't regard him as legitimate. Barack Obama was regarded by the opposition as illegitimate, you know, for all these reasons of, oh, he's got a Muslim name, he's really a Muslim, he was born in Kenya, not a, blah, 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 basically not regarded as legitimate because of the color of his skin, let's be honest. And now this guy, uh, who the opposition regards as not legitimate because he was probably elected by Russia. Um, and something happens to the fabric of the country, I think, when the opposition just will not acknowledge the person who won as legitimate, as legitimately elected, as belonging for this little period of time in the people's house. Uh, and I think, you know, far beyond the details of the individuals involved, that's a, an American problem that I don't, I have no idea how you get back from there, but it's, it's a road, it's a road down. And, and yeah, people are angrier because they don't regard the occupant of the White House as, as legitimately elected. Why should they get, afford any, any measure of credibility, uh, uh, respect?
to this person. And so you get this much more vituperative quality. I mean, American politics has always been vituperative. Uh, we, we Americans are so, we so love ignorance about our history, you know, because it allows us to create this mythical country that we claim to live in, you know, that is exceptional, so we never had slavery and we never had colonies and we never did genocide, we never did all that thing that all countries do if they get the power to do it. Um, and we like to believe that there was a period of time when there was more gentility to American politics. It's always been pre pretty rough and tumble. Ma, ma, where's my pa? He's in the White House. Ha, ha, ha was a, a slogan from 1876 about uh, a president who was reputed to have had an illegitimate child. That was pretty, that was pretty vituperative for a slightly more uh, proper age. But, um, but I think it has gotten worse. Let's do one more question from Twitter and we'll wrap things up. This is from Joshua who just beat the buzzer. Joshua asks, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, Harry, on how political correctness um, affects comedy. It shouldn't. Um, I think the, the golden rule is uh, if it's funny, it goes. Uh, if it's not funny, it's over the line and, and shouldn't be said and you know, all that stuff happens. But if you're, I'll give you a great example, uh, just in my, in my mind, because it just, I just saw it a couple months ago. There's a wonderful, this isn't satirical, this is just comedic, but I think it applies. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, comedy show uh, that's been on BBC Two here and in the States on Showtime called Episodes, which is basically a satire of Hollywood. Uh, and... I just couldn't believe what I saw in uh, an episode of episodes this season. Um, short version is a husband and wife are writers on a show. They, it's not their show. And the showrunner is sitting in the room with them. They're having auditions for cast to be in this new series. And the scene begins with the wife of the husband and wife team saying, I thought we agreed we weren't going to see this actor. And the showrunner says, no, no, he'll be good. Let's, why, let's give him a chance. And she says, but as I recall the premise of this series we're doing, it requires the, all of the actors to play more than one part. And I just think the wheelchair might get in the way of that. <laughs> and he says, no, 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 come on, let's give him a chance. Door opens. Hello, good people. Man in a wheelchair. Very, very good. Hail fellow well met in a wheelchair starts to roll into the room, and now spends two minutes trying to maneuver his wheelchair through the doorway into the office. Back and forth and back and forth with the little sounds, and, and I, do, I do not do it justice. Uh, it's fall down funny. If it weren't fall down funny, it would be inexcusable. But it's fall down funny. You can't help yourself. It's just too effing funny. Um, and I think, you know, Yes, political correctness has to do, I mean, the, the, the phrase has just been butchered to death uh, by, among others, <laughs> President Trump, um, to mean whatever he wants it to mean. Uh, there, there obviously has been a movement on college, on university campuses more than anywhere else to sort of enforce new rules of speech. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just think it's, it's looking at it in the long view uh, I find it a bit amusing that college students of my generation were demonstrating and marching to have university administrators not act in loco parentis. And now you have college students actively demanding that universities act in loco parentis to protect them from speech they find they might be triggered by. Uh, it's, it's just the wheel, man. It's just the wheel. Um, but in terms of how it applies to, you just have to make sure that when you're, when you're getting near the line, that it's really funny. It's not a, could be funny if, you know, it, it, that's, your, that's your job anyway. But in, when you're, the more sensitive the material, the more the onus is on you, be funnier or, or shut up. Speaking of um, institutions of uh, higher learning, since we are 
at the University of Cambridge um, to end on, on like a, uh, a summing up of things. Um, do you, <laughs> any words of wisdom for students out there or in here, actually? Um, I always wonder where out there is. We always talk about the it. internet. Oh, the internet. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, um, um, ace your tests. Um, no, I. I uh, I have a, a godson who uh, is is just uh, uh, he's in his mid twenties and he's just kind of gotten really good at what he started out thinking he wanted to do, and is wondering if that's what he still wants to do. And uh, I I tried uh, I, I grew up in show business, but I then took a little break, and I I tried journalism. I tried for real. And I tried uh, teaching school for a couple of years, and I, I worked at a state legislature in Sacramento for a year. So I tried everything I thought I might like, and then I came scurrying back to show business. Uh, and um, there's so much pressure these days to find your track, get on your track, follow your track, don't don't get distracted off your track. And obviously the the the, st the unremediated state of the economies in both the United States and Great Britain put pressures on kids uh, that we never had in, in my era. Uh, the idea of coming out of university thousands or multiple thousands of dollars in debt is like the strangest thing in the world to me. Uh, and what, what that's doing to our societies uh, uh, you, you you see it in statistics every day of uh, delay in uh, new household formation, uh, delay in uh, the, the uh, just reported this week the, de the continued decline in American fertility. Uh, people are are saying to public opinion polls uh, that they want uh, more freedom, uh, which is fine. I, I believe in it. I don't I don't have kids, but uh, that. These economic pressures work to prevent you from inviting that question: Is this what I really want to do? You know, as you get out of university and get pretty good at something in the first four or five years, that is a gift you will never get again. Is what I said to my godson. You know, you, you can do, you can screw around a lot of ways in your twenties, but asking thinking seriously, is this really what I want to do for the next 40, 50, 60, 70 years is, uh, is the best way to, to fuck off in your 20s. That's a great quote to end on. <laughs> um, I think the University of Cambridge has had a lot of uh, prestigious speakers and interesting speakers. I'm pretty sure you're, you're, in, the, you're in the top part. That's, that's my opinion. But can we please thank Harry Shearer for coming today. And thank you. We get up and I just have to take advantage of this moment to say the new Derek Small solo record is out now. <laughs> And on that note, thank you all very much. <laughs> Harry, Tyler, thank you so very much. We hope to see all of you again at future events. Those of you online from Pennsylvania or wherever else you were, thanks a lot. See you again soon. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Excellent.